here teaching at Fleischer, and uh, it's my first time doing a webinar here um, for Fleischer. So this is going to be a pretty cool ride, and let, let's see how this turns out. Um, already we had a question uh, from someone um, that's visiting the webinar, and uh, they were asking about materials and uh, what what are we going to do? So for today, I decided to give a very introductory level um, intro to like figure drawing and figure proportions. Um, so because this is so, um, this is such a basic exercise, we really don't need any specific material. So if you're going to be following through the instructions or if you're going to be following me as I draw, the, you can use any material that you have at hand, graphite, charcoal, soft pastel. You can even try it in oils and it's, it's, the exercise will come through. Um, if you have any questions about any of these materials, just ask away. Um, I'm, I don't talk much. <laughs> I will explain um, the very ba basic essence of this measurement. So if you have any questions, I highly encourage you to ask away as many things as you can. Um, so this might take a, like 20, 25 minutes as I cover most of the proportions for the eight head figures in a, a static standing position. And uh, I think like the rest of the time will be consumed as I draw uh, from a picture um, the, the figure. Uh, and there you can see a little bit better um, what steps I omit, what steps I stick to. Um, so I think that'll be it. Sorry if this gets a little rowdy here. I'm gonna change the view. So right now, um, so that you can see the materials I'll be using, I'm just gonna use my vine charcoal that's like a charcoal holder and you can see i i sharpened the tip uh very nice this i i do this in order to have the most control of my lines as possible and also to have um, a little bit more quality of line when using materials soft materials and impermanent materials like the fine charcoal or soft pastel or other materials that are broader um, it's very um, uh, nice to sharpen them in order to get lines that go from thicker to thinner. Uh, right now, this is a medium vine charcoal. And what we're going to do, I'm working on newsprint paper. And what we're going to do, for those of you who have never approached the figure before, uh, something I find very easy to understand is like when you have the figure standing, draw one line on top, one line on the bottom. If you're working small, this is gonna be a lot easier. I like working big. It, it's a lot more comfortable for me in order to get more details, to fix and correct things. It's, it's, for me, it's a lot easier. So make a top line, make a bottom line, and that will be the length, the height of your figure. So the top line right over here will be the top of the head. And the bottom line over here will be the bottom of your feet, of the feet of the model or of the feet of the structure. Once that line is done, I will draw a line straight down the middle, all the way down, splitting that figure in half. At this point, we only want symmetry to happen. So top line, bottom line, I split that into half with a vertical line that vertical axis i break it down in half again horizontally so i step back in order to measure a little bit and the the best part of using vine charcoal is that it's a very um sorry it's a very um, um forgiving material so once you're drawing as you're drawing your material I think there looks a little better. I, the, the material will give you the chance of erasing and uh, not having stained the paper too much. 
you're going to notice if you're working on on uh, newsprint paper that the newsprint paper is not very forgiving. So every mark that you make is going to stain the paper. Um, some artists use this to their advantage. They they work and rework over the the paper, not just the Stonehenge paper, but any other type of paper, and they call that a priming. That surface is already stained with all that charcoal. It already gives it another tone, and then they work over. So this is not just one way to do it. So once you split that in half, that's the half of your figure. It should be. Um, it should be where the base of your pubic bone sits. So genitals should be around here. So top line, bottom line, center vertical axis, break that in half. And then we're gonna split the spaces until we have eight. So we split in half again. Half and half, and then another half over here. And now we have eight spaces. I hope you can see that clearly. If you don't, please let me know. I can move this rig around. Um, and the eight head measurements comes to us like from centuries ago in Renaissance. Um, uh, they were obsessed, well not obsessed, but, but the human figure was part, an essential part of the creation of art. And they were moving away from the dark ages into the rebirth of the idea of like human would be the center of everything. And uh, they were looking for all this uh, uh, geometric proportions to understand the architecture of the figure. So Leonardo da Vinci, Alter Dürer, they all came up with a set of measurements that landed around here. It's either seven, seven and a half heads, or eight heads. And uh, now we know that those measurements were made to, um, they were made as, an, as, as the main part or the main architecture of the figure, but are meant to be questioned and moved. So we will start with neck shape for the head work very lightly. There's no need to put too much pressure on your material. And if you have noticed, I have been holding the, the uh, uh, vine charcoal holder either far away or kind of flat. I'm, I'm not trying to push the tip into it and lose that sharpness. I'm trying to, as I work, to keep that tip of the, of the charcoal sharp. So we got the head that first square or that first two lines will be the head top of the head and the chin will be sitting there then we have the next step over here you want to split that into thirds so one third below the chin one third below the chin would be the distance for the neck or where the clavicle starts so right around here, our rib cage starts to, to, to form a little bit higher than that, but around one third below the chin. So we got square one, the head, square two, where our neck starts, one third below the chin. We will have the rib cage that starts around that one third. Square number three is where our around two thirds of that space is where the bottom part of the rib cage is and as you can see i'm moving from top to bottom of the figure and uh, i'm doing this because I'm, i right now i want you to only think about the proportions in a vertical manner we're going to move to the sides later on third square is where the rib cage ends it the the rib cage part ends a little bit around two thirds of that space. So you're still gonna have a little bit of space on that third 
area for your spine to show through in. And then we have the four space, which is the half of the figure. And you're going to see that this top half is going to have a lot more information than the bottom half. And here we have the pubic bone that kind of sits a little bit lower than that fourth uh, uh, line. And it should measure around um, the width of the head and the clavicle. So it should be around here. Usually also par a little bit parallel or close to the edges of the ribcage. And the very basic shape that I have found to be kind of helpful is that the rib cage, the, the pubic bone is close looking to a butterfly. So it's going to be something like this. And there you have it. It's half of the figure is already done. And then we have the trochanter bone over here. And there is where the femur mounts. The femur is very, it's, a, it's the longest bone in the figure. So it's gonna take two heads. I think this is a little bit too long. So the, the femur being the longest bone is going to take the length of two heads. So that's going to go from the fourth line, the bottom part of the, of the pubic bone, all the way down into the sixth space. And if you stand in a mirror, and this is something I tell my students when we're talking about these measurements, is the angle of how the bones work. So the femur goes in an angle inwards. And then in the bottom part of that sixth space is where our knees rest. So bottom part of our knees is going to rest on that um, uh, line on the bottom part of the sixth space. And then space seven and eight are reserved for the rest of the legs that will, sorry, that will be sitting a little bit, that will be becoming a little bit more straight and uh, the measurement for our feet would be more more or less the same amount of space from the chin to the neck so it's going to be a third and for that we're just going to make a small feet triangle shape or something geometric that resembles a triangle and that way we have covered top to bottom those basic measurements of the head of, of the whole figure. Now we want to measure the arms and how do we measure this? We, we know that one third of space from the chin to the neck, there is where the clavicle should begin. And how do we know the, the width of the figure for this harmonic figures is three heads is the classical measurement. So if you have any doubts, just draw two heads to the side. And, uh, and that should be more or less the width of your figure. Remember, these, are, these measurements are all meant to be questioned, especially when you're working from life. If you're working from life, all of these measurements are to be compared to your model. They're, they're not 100% accurate. Um, Especially, I, I, I have tried this many times and uh, I don't fit most of the measurements that are canon in terms of, of the classical canons for the figure. So three heads for the width of the figure and, uh, and the arms, if you, if you stand up and if you touch your own body as you're drawing, your elbows should sit around this space right here, right below the rib cage. 
Your elbows should be sitting right below the rib cage. And then from the elbow to the wrist, your wrist should be um, uh, around the area of the trochanter or where the femur mounts into the pubic bone. And then your hands should be almost one head. And uh, your hands should be sitting close to the middle part of the, um, of the femur. And uh, here is where I say my arms are too long and my hands are uh, way below the half part of my femur. So if I were to draw myself, I wouldn't be using this measurements as my last resort or as my main uh, source of, of of reference, I would get this and then remeasure and revisit all of these measurements in order to get a likeness. Um, and uh, I have found that likeness is a lot more easier achieved when thinking about um, a set of proportions or that very, very basic architecture. So we're going to do this also from the side. And uh, as you can see, I'm just going to migrate those same lines that I did before. So one head, two heads, three heads, four heads, five heads, six heads, seven, and eight. And uh, same thing, it, all of these measurements, they're gonna migrate regardless of which angle you're seeing the model. Um, I forgot to say in that third line, it's around the center of your rib cage. This should be the area of the chest or the nipples, but as we know, that's not like a very standard uh, uh, measurement. So anyhow, if you're, trying to locate and you're working with a, a male model, uh, the area of the nipple should be around that third line. So same thing, I'm working ahead over here. One third of that space is dedicated to the neck. After that, I can start working my rib cage. That spine is going to mount for my um, pubic bone. Then my femur is going to be showing through. And my knee is going to sit right on the bottom line for that six square. And then space seven and eight are my feet. And then we're going to put like a big foot there because I have big feet too. And there you have it. It's very um, simplified. This can get a little bit more complicated. If I start fleshing in some of these areas, like I said, the third line should be for the chest. So if I do that, I start to get a chest. That rib cage gives me the hint of all of those fleshy areas. So the area of the belly or the flop of the belly, it, it, it will depend on the model, but it should sit around there. You're gonna see the, the muscle of the glute and the area of the butt is gonna be a little bit more boxy. Genitals will be around here. I'm gonna erase some of that structure so that you can see where those lines are going. Genital starts here. Then knee. Calf, my feet. And that's a profile figure. Um, I don't know if you have any questions that you want me to address, if there's anything uh, that you're interested in knowing as I go, please interrupt. I'm going to use this eraser just, well, no, it's too short. So 
if, if we were to compare the figure with other uh, set of measurements, like instead of thinking of the eight heads, they were, uh, historically, there were many ways of measuring, like even how many hands does the figure is in terms of height. Those measurements are very, very small, uh, and uh, it could get very complicated when you have too many uh, units to, to think through. So, Jotham, really yeah. quickly, a uh, question. Uh, there's actually two. One is how would this figure look when kneeling or lying down? How would the proportions look, I assume? So in, in when the figure is sitting, it, it should take two heads. So it should be around six heads um, for the sitting figure and reclining figure. So let's say, Let's say that we have a reclining figure or a sitting figure. One, two, three, four. That will be our first half of the body or top half of the figure. Just to light. Right, our rib cage would be around here. And then that fourth head is literally the pubic bone sitting. So what is done is that the measurement for the resting four heads is done like that. So four or five, so it should be four heads and then the two heads for the sitting figure. Reclining poses, like let's say an angle, like a, a pose where a model is reclined on an angle or that you have for shortening, is a little bit more complicated. There are many ways to approach that. You can learn perspective in the process of trying to figure out how the figure projects into space. The easiest way that I have found to teach um, um, the foreshortening is through copying an image especially using um, very uh, simplified structures like abstractions from the Charles Barg drawing course. Or um, let, me, let me show you real quick. Going through process in books like this, I don't know if that's looking like sharp or not. Yeah, we can see that. So, so the Charles Bard drawing course is, I use it in class because it's a really good way of thinking in terms of abstracting the figure um, in a very geometric and simplified manner. This, all of these measurements are very intro and they're very limiting. So the way I approach this in class is that I teach this in the first class and then we go over more intuitive and more gestural drawings where we combine these measurements against a um, a more intuitive way of drawing not so much like measuring all the heads into it okay um there's another question how do you sharpen your charcoal so sharp yeah so razor blade and uh, this I show in class, you just very lightly, if you're right-handed, you hold it like this. If you're left-handed, you if you're right-handed, hold the razor blade in your right hand. And then lightly sharpen your uh, vine charcoal. Once it gets the shape that you like, it should go from like the broadest part to like thinner. I use sandpaper. And on a flat surface, I push the vine charcoal in a rotation so that you can get the sharp tip. Um, there are different brands of vine charcoal. There are some very good ones like, I don't know, Nitrum or whatever. And um, then there are very, not bad, but uh, I don't enjoy that much. Like. Uh, there's a brand that has two A's on the logo, like, uh, I don't know, I can't, I can't remember, but 
their fire pit is not that good. So you will have to be a little bit more sensible to how the material is behaving uh, when you're sharpening. And then the same thing I do for my um, charcoal pencils. And uh, this gives me quality of line. That's why when I started the drawings and time site, I can go from like very thin into broad lines, all within one tool. And that way I save time. I save uh, 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 having to change materials into like, oh, I need to make something broad. No, like my material is already doing it because of the way I sharpened it. And, uh, and the way we sharpened it, it's, it's also, it, it will also slowly condition how do you think about the material. So when you're drawing with a tool that's like very, very sharp, we tend to be very careful. And, uh, and I try to tell my students not to hold it like a, like a regular pencil, like as if you were going to write. Uh, there are ways to use a pencil like that, but for most of the time, I want uh, or I look for uh, ways to hold the vine charcoal, the pencil, the material as far away as possible. This will, I'm very, very, very heavy handed. So a lot of this treatment for the type of drawing that I do needs a gentler hand, which I don't have, because I will go in there and just like mess it up. And uh, holding the, the vine charcoal very far back will put less stress on the tip you're gonna have less precision, which is, which is also good. Because in the beginning of your drawing, you don't want to be uh, too committed to any of the lines that you're making. For example, if we were working with the set of proportions that we were just working now, if I would have done this with a very hard compressed charcoal or with a charcoal pencil, that will be very difficult. And as you can see, it's very difficult to erase um, the vine charcoal in this paper. So imagine if I would have done that with a very uh, final material or a finishing material like a compressed charcoal. Um, so keeping a light touch and keeping a light material like the vine charcoal will also help in the development of your drawing um, as it progress and, and, and uh, it, it creates less trouble, especially when, you, when we are learning and uh, as figurative artists, we're always learning about new ways of rendering the figure. And uh, keeping a moment, keeping those initial minutes, I would say those first 45 to an hour, very loose so that you can move things around is very important. So that you can get the resolution of the image that you want um, and the way you want your figure to look at. So I will go over those measurements real quick one more time. And then if, any of you is following the drawing as I go. After this, I will start a drawing from a photography from a nude model I had. So I will use some of these measurements and you will see a little bit more of my process as I go. Sorry, can I interrupt you just one more time? Of course. There's two more questions. Um, is there a vertical line for aligning side view relationship, feet, head, mass, et cetera? Yeah, but it's it kind of looks very very static. So let me. I'm I'm trying. To, I knew this question would come, and I'm trying to look for the example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so these are very static positions. None of your models is ever going to have this pose. It's it's it would be horrible and excruciating um, uh, for them to hold this for an hour or two in, in of a drawing. But the alignment from the side goes from the shoulder to the trochanter there on, the, on your uh, pubic bone, to the knees, to the ankle. And uh, we'll go from the ear, shoulder, trochanter or hip, knee, and, and uh, your ankle. But like I said, no model will assume that pose um, and uh, it will be very difficult for most models to assume it for a long period of time. And one last question. Could you, yep. could you restate the Charles uh, Brog uh, course? Yes, I'm, I, 
I can show, so the way I have developed my class and even though I have studied art, the, I, my, my undergrad didn't have a very strong uh, creative structure. So I had to do a lot of research and a lot of reading and kind of like self thought in a way. So I have found that these books are, I also had them at hand because I knew this will come. Um, these are the books that I find to be the most appropriate for teaching a drawing class, a figure drawing class, because they don't show you a style. So the first one would be The Human Figure by John H. Vanderpoel. And this, this book you can find online for like $4. It's super cheap. I recommend it to all my students. And uh, it's, the illustrations are beautiful. And the, the book has an essay for every part of the figure, like the head, the nose and mouth. It goes into very uh, uh, mathematical details about all these proportions. So this is The Human Figure by John H. Vanderpoel. And uh, this is very good. That book was created for painters, drafts people, and sculpture uh, only. Um, so it's a very painters oriented book. And then I have the complete guide to life drawing. And the same, it's not showing you a style, it's showing you ways to tackle the figure in an incredible amount of exercises. Um, this is a little bit more expensive. I think it was like $40, um, but it, it is an amazing buy. Um, and it has so many exercises and cool stuff, like many uh, different materials, different ways like cutouts, uh, cutting out head size shapes and then combining them together to create the figure. Um, and it, it has very good, um, it, it's very well written in terms of approaching the proportions of the figure. And then lastly is the Charles Bart drawing course. I don't know if you, there. And uh, this book, a lot of people criticize this book and uh, they have reason to criticize it. It's, it's, it's made, it's been thought to close the mind of people and how to render the figure into a style. But the way I have, a, I have come to understand it over time is, is not just a book for copies. As I have shown you, it has some plates. I use some of this for homeworks for my students and it gives them a really good sense to abstract the figure. And uh, the draw, the, the, the Charles Park starts with very simplified, very abstract angular lines, which I, which I am more inclined to draw like. And uh, more than a book just for copies is a book on a, for understanding abstraction, I would say. An abstraction of the figure into very simplified shapes and angles. That will go beyond um, the basic measurements that we're talking about. Yes, the eight heads is very important to learn, but I would say like most of the time I'm relying on my angles, on angular lines and how they behave one another in terms of like relationship of rhythm and within the drawing and so forth. So I will go back again and do this um, basic measurement. So top line, bottom line, split that down the center so that you can have equal parts on each side. Split that space in half. And then you're gonna keep splitting those spaces in half as you go until you get eight spaces. Thank 
For a square, the head, one third of that space for the neck. Neck and clavicle will be around there. And there you can start your kind of like pear shape for the rib cage. I'm using a kneaded eraser. Um, it's like one of my favorite drawing tools because it's very versatile. It picks up the material, but I can shape it into any form I like. And if I want to make like very sharp lines when I'm hatching, um, I can use that as well. Instead of like cutting up some rigid eraser, I use also this as kind of like a stump. So when, uh, when I'm saturating the, the paper with material, I use the, uh, needed eraser as, uh, as a tool to smooth out instead of erasing. That third line around here should be the area of the nipple. So one, first space, the head, second space, the, the beginning of the rib cage, third space, fourth space, Pubic bone. Kind of the pubic bone kind of extends a little bit lower than that center line. And uh, and that's usually where the femur mounts. Or not usually where it where 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 it sits. Remember that the knees seat, sit on top of that six line, and then the rest of the leg gets a little bit straight, but following that fall and of that angle. And as you can see, I'm not afraid to go back and erase and revisit. It's part of the process to constantly move your drawing, to move the lines. Don't commit, don't ever commit to something final in the beginning of your drawing. And then one third from, from the bottom line to the top would be the area of the feet. Three heads more or less for the edges of the shoulder. And there your clavicles are around there. Your shoulders, uh, your, your elbows should be sitting closer to the bottom part of that rib cage. So you will, got, you will have your shoulders, your, oh my God, your elbows around there. And then you will have the rest of the arm. Your wrists should come close to the trochanter there on the femur. And then two thirds of a head for the hands. And I say two thirds, and this is kind of like a prank we pull on kids in Puerto Rico. I bet you do it also here, where you tell your kids to measure their face. And if their face is like the size of their hands, I don't know, some, you pull a prank and you hit them on the face. You can do the hat, but not hit yourself on the face. And this is how you can measure the size of your hands or your face. So from your wrist to the top of the finger should be from the chin to your hairline. Like I said, your bottom half of the figure should be equal or a little bit longer than the first half. 
So if I cut that figure in half, the top half should be a little bit shorter than the bottom half. And uh, when you're doing figure drawing, it's always better to have longer legs than shorter legs. Uh, shorter legs, it's, it's something that everyone will notice right away. And, um, and especially if, if it's not an intentional distortion. If it's someone that is looking for, um, for proportionate figure, it's always better to work your legs a little bit longer than they appear. And uh, sometimes we tend to think like the legs are already too long, but that's totally false. I, I usually say to my students to overcompensate in the areas where they think they're making the thing too long, like the arms or the legs, because oftentimes they're doing it way too short. And uh, what that means is that they are um, uh, afraid or scared that their figure will look up deproportioned to the set of measurements. But like I, like I said, always work your legs a little bit longer than the top half of your figure. Um, if you're looking for other type of measurements, usually your rib cage should be around the width of the pubic bone. And uh, the length of the head should be around the length between the rib cage. So that one head would go from the edge of the rib cage to the edge of the rib cage. That will cover the neck muscles right there. Um, also, other measurement that's kind of useful is from the top of the head to the mark of your um, of, of the joint of the clavicle there in the center of, of the rib cage around the sternum. So from top of the head to here, that should be the measurement for the width of your um, of your pubic bone. So that's about right. Um, yeah, uh, any other questions? I thought I would have have time to start um, in a, another, like a longer drawing, but I don't know if like other questions want to like come up. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat box. Does anyone else have any other questions? Cool. So then I'll start that. So those set of measurements are the same for are, are that basic architecture for the figure. So if I were, this is a Canson uh, uh, mid-tone gray or still gray neutral paper. Uh, I'm using the soft side instead of the bumpy side. And uh, I'm going to do the same thing. Those lines, top and bottom, are going to be your uh, your control so that your figure is not too elongated. And uh, this is more or less how I would start my drawing. So And I'm still using that same ratio of like trying to find the midpoint between the top and bottom line. And that's right where my, uh, uh, the pubic bone area is sitting. The model I'm drawing has a contraposal. That means that one side of the figure is resting and the other one is engaged. Um, and uh, this creates rhythm. As you can see, that line from the pubic bone already has a depression or an angle. And 
Jotham, could you show us what you're working from? Uh, yeah. So I literally just went on Google earlier today and uh, and just searched Croquis Cafe. And uh, they have really good selection of, of pictures and models. Obviously, you have to pay for getting better resolution. But for the purpose of right now, this is fine. Thanks. Yep. So that center line, I'm still using that same center line as I was using before uh, for that original uh, very basic drawing. So my pubic bone should be around here. And that's a very strong box, boxy figure um, or boxy area. Let me give a little clarity there. So I captured that gesture. I look for the center line in order to have a proportionate half and half. And uh, now I'm just looking for angles in, in the areas where those important eight head measurements met. And uh, art has a lot to do with like natural order of things. So it's like a lot of this stuff, it's like domino effect. So if my figure is already taking this weird positions, the whole structure of the body, that, that architecture, that basic skeleton, is going to tumble um, to counter react some of that um, um, like situation. Um, And the model has the arm going inward. And one of the reasons that I like using and teaching with the gray paper or with a generally with a toned paper is that when working with buying charcoal is very forgiving and it gives the students and, uh, and it gives me a lot of chance to make mistakes and fix without having too many troubles. Especially the Canson, the, the gray tone will receive very well the, the buying charcoal. Um, and just for reference, this is not how I would do my drawings usually, but just for reference, I will add some light already to the drawing so that you can see how I already added some flesh to that area of the figure. And uh, right now I'm gonna use Conti Crayon. Um, I'm very low on white chalk, so I'm, I'm going to be using Conti Crayon. Any Conti Crayon or soft uh, or, or uh, any Conti Crayon really will work. It's very similar in terms of like being a dry medium, so you wouldn't have any problems in terms of comp being compatible. Um, They interact very well. I try to keep my shadows and my lights separated because I really don't want to uh, mess up some of those uh, beautiful transitions. And I want to maximize the use of the tone paper. So as I'm working, I want to keep the tone of the paper in for my mid-tones or depending on, on the tone of the paper, um, I could, avoid using blacks and just like work with my lights. 
Um, it will all depend on the paper that you choose. The, I would say the major problem with working with light too early into your drawing is that the paper is not going to be so forgiving to that material. So you're probably going to end up having more trouble um, erasing and making sure that that surface looks right. Right now, I just want to block in major light masses just for this process where, and how we're doing this. But keep in mind, I wouldn't do this this way if it was my drawing. Something that really helps me is keeping a brush um, close to me so that I can smooth out a lot of these transitions. And uh, this also helps me cover a lot more space quicker. Something that some of my students have questioned about um, the use of materials when we were working with, with, uh, with the vine charcoals, is, with the vine charcoal, is that they have trouble. Um, making the time with while they're working and by that I mean like getting an area covered um, they can be prejudiced against the material somehow and uh, and this way it, it it because it's so forgiving it gives them a lot of tools to go from and uh, it, it takes the fear away from just like covering a space and rendering. And uh, and as I added all of that shadow with the vine charcoal and spread it and spread it with the with the brush, um, I'm I'm working reductively. And by that I mean that with the eraser, I'm actually drawing and taking out the lights of that shadow. Uh, if I want softer transitions, I will tap until i don't know if you can see it but until the eraser gets saturated once it's saturated with the material i would um it will start to be working less as an eraser and more as a stump I'm, I'm just massing in the lights. Sorry, Joth, I'm just um, double checking. It's Conti crayon that you're using for highlights, right? White, white Conti crayon, you can also use the, the white chalk from the General's brand is, is very good. Um, I, I like, I enjoy more the, the Conti, the texture, um, and it's, it's a lot brighter. But like I said, if you're working with the Conti crayon too early into your drawing and committing to some of those areas where you're not sure if that's going to be right, you're probably going to stumble and get into trouble with your with your drawing.
And again, just going back and forth between uh, the real measurements that I had at the beginning of my drawing, as you can see, I kind of knew that this was pretty right, but some of this area in terms of like the width of those shoulders against the proportions that we were working wasn't working for this model. This model is a little bit more square than, than some of the proportions suggested. So I, I didn't hesitate it. I just like erased that area and uh, and just like moved, moved the drawing around. That's what all the, what we consider the old master would have done. They wouldn't have hesitated. They would have erased and fixed the drawing. In terms of value, when you're working the figure, um, the same thing as if you're painting, uh, the legs, the arms, and the head should be warmer. And then uh, if you're working with colors, so they should be warmer, they should be around the earth, warmer earth tones. If you're working with your drawing, they should be a little bit darker in terms of value. Um, and this is because one, blood flow, the models have been standing there for a long period of time. Sorry, for a long period of time, and uh, the 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 blot goes to the areas where it's getting a lot more stress, and uh, and also because those are areas where we get more sun, so you have a a, a lot paler or brighter skin um, in areas that are covered, usually covered, like the areas of the breast and the torso. And, uh, and you will have warmer tones or colors for the areas that are more exposed. So Jotham, it's 7.30. We're gonna take another couple of minutes to finish up. And if we have any last remaining questions, sure. please let us know. What is the name of the gray paper? Oh, it's a, it, the brand is Canson. You can get this graph more too, but it's Canson. Um, I don't know how to pronounce the, the tiny label. Um, let me look real quick, because I know the label was around here somewhere. Oh, wait. But it's, it's Canson and the paper is steel gray. And uh, I use the steel gray paper because it's a neutral gray. It's not cool, it's not warm, it's, it's totally neutral. And uh, it's very helpful for students to start understanding um, uh, a way of generating volume into their drawings. I'm gonna put this a little bit closer. So that students can understand a little bit better um, the creation of volume. It's not it, the the thinking process changes in terms of like when you're adding value instead of subtracting or working with your white paper. Um, it's a lot more forgiving. Like I said, when you're working with light materials like the vine charcoal or powdered charcoal, you can clean it very very easily. Um, yeah, it's very helpful for, for painters that um, are interested in, in a little bit more classical methods. And that's why I said I encourage any type of tone, not just the Canson uh, mid-tone gray, but I also, for my work, I also use like other, um, other colors and values. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jotham. There's a comment from Asima. Um, she says, when we have a chance to tell you to say hello, you and the curator Humberto Fuguero to say hello, and that they're all from Ponce, Puerto Rico. Woo! Yeah, mi gente, gracias. <laughs>
Um, the other question is the white general chalk erasable visa Conte. Thanks so much. Yes. So Conti is a little bit more silky. It's going to stick to the paper a lot stronger. The, my experience with the, with the charcoal general, uh, it's, it's a little bit more forgiving. The intensity of the light is less, so you will have to work a little bit more in order to get stronger light. So the Conti will give me stronger lights, more immediate. Great. Okay. Sure. I don't think there's any other questions so, so far coming in. For everyone who's here to join us, thank you so much. You can check out Jotham's work in the link that uh, Liz Grimaldi just provided to everyone. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. So great to see so many familiar faces. Um, if you want to support us and donate to Fleischer, our development team has provided some links that you'll see in the chat box if you scroll up. Um, we'd love your support. Jotham, thank you so much for tonight. So great, wonderful presentation. Um, yeah. Stay healthy, everyone. Stay safe. And thank you so much. Take care. Yeah.